Thanks for tuning in to the Business of Biotech. I'm your host, Matt Piller. And on today's show, I'm talking SPAC with our friend and biotech finance guru, Alan Shaw. Now, whether you're an investor or more importantly, in the context of this show, a biotech founder, sponsor, or both, special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs are a finance vehicle you should be familiar with. And chances are that given all the SPAC activity happening right now, you're at least somewhat familiar with what they are and how they work. Today, Alan and I are going to start there and drill down into the good, the bad, the ugly, and the implications of SPACs. Alan, it's always great to talk with you. Thanks, Mac. Great to be back and look forward to another robust conversation. Yeah, me too. Let's start with those basics. What, what, is, a, what is a SPAC? Uh, a, SPAC a SPAC, as you said, stands for a Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. A lot of times people might refer to it as a blank check company. And in many, and some people would call it public private equity in, in some respects. So there's a number of different analogies that have uh, been attributed to SPACs. Uh, simply put, it's a, uh, it's a hunting license. You know, you're basically forming a company, uh, a shell company uh, that has money and is told to go hunting for a company. And um, there's also a time element associated. Typically, there's a, a two year time element. Uh, associated with it. So, you know, so there are some t- some parameters. They need to move pretty quickly because there's a whole process associated with all of that. Um, okay. But that, that, that would be it in, a, in a nutshell. And, and, and they've gone through different flavors over the years. You know, it's kind of like platform shoes. You know, they come in fashion and out of fashion. Uh, you know, last decade they went, they were very popular in the around 2000 and Five through 2009, and we can come back to that later on because there's certainly parallelisms um, yeah. to where we stand today. Um, yeah. But, you know, they are they have become very uh, popular, to say the least. I've heard terms attributed to them like it's raining SPACs out. I, I think it's even become cocktail party fodder. If we had cocktail parties right now, yeah. I think everybody would be talking about their SPAC. I mean, we've seen them across the spectrum of industries. I think athletes are doing them, musicians are doing them it's it seems like if you're not doing one you know there you know you have to ask yourself why particularly in terms of asset management and 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 uh, investors and what you're seeing now is they're even doing son of spec you know after they've done their first spec they've they've coming back and doing there's repeat issues of specs and I, i've actually was involved with specs earlier in my career uh, during spec uh, 1.0 before the current version so it is a, it is something that's interesting and it's, I think it is particularly well suited for the, uh, the biotech industry, given the nature of specialist investors. The, this concept sounds a, a little bit risky. You know, it sounds kind of like, uh, you know, an, an arranged marriage with a spouse who's perhaps unknown and perhaps unwilling, but uh, with, with even higher financial stakes. It sounds like a, a pretty, pretty big gamble. Um, you know, I could be, maybe I'm just too risk averse, but br- break down that risk factor for us. What does it look like? You know, there's two sides of a coin, right? There, there's, there's certainly risks. Nothing, nothing without benefits comes with risks. If there are, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up for that every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there are benefits too. I don't know whether it makes sense to talk about some of the benefits before you get into the risks to have context. Sure. You know, um, but, you know, with, with that, you know, if you're looking to go public, you know, certainly from a biotech perspective, you can look at it from a, a broader perspective as well. Um, but it, it usually you need to build out your uh, your cap table. You usually need to build out validated investors uh, that kind of speak to your story, particularly biotech. You know, if you want to go public, you need to bring your own beer to the party effectively. Mm-hmm. And that, that requires to have an investor base. So typically what you see in biotech is the need to do a crossover round of financing before you go public. Uh, a SPAC allows you to kind of circumvent that in many respects, and you can kind of get public kind of through the crossover process in some respects. And there's, there's different uh, considerations on how you can make that happen and how you facilitate that. But just wanted to give a, la- a little bit of, and there's other considerations as well, because all SPACs are certainly not created equal. That That's for sure. They come in different shapes and sizes and, and the pedigree. It's all about pedigree like most things in life. But uh, to, to your points about risk, uh, 
You know, there are risks, you know, while a SPAC for a lot of companies, the cash that's in the trust, and I'll be happy to elaborate what that means, is, is can p- appear like an oasis, but it can quickly turn into a mirage. So, you know, just because you think you're getting married to somebody, you know, the dowry may not be there when you get there, yeah. uh, you know, if you want to think of it like that. Well, expl- ex- explain how that, you know, like what, what is the possibility of that? What does the possibility of that look like? So if, if, if it looks like an oasis and it could 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 uh, end up being in a mirage, what happens between the vision of the oasis <laughs> and the vision of the mirage? <laughs> and, it, and it's not a cheap pet trick either. You know, there's no magic involved here, but it's re- it re- but there's a lot of choreography. Mm. So when a, a SPAC raises money, uh, it goes into a trust and people get economics, they get a promote associated with all of that. And there's other factors like warrants that build that build into the economics and the math. But basically that, that promote is a 20% promote. And it's kind of akin to if you're doing a crossover around um, financing, you know, people generally view the crossover financing is going to be at a discount to the IPO. Mm-hmm. So rather than t- doing the crossover discount, taking the market risk, and you just jump into it, you take the discount basically on their promote and, and you're a public company. It's akin to a reverse merger really. And it's a question, of, like, and, and we can talk about reverse mergers, but it's, a SPAC is a reverse merger. The only difference is it it, it may or may not come with cash. Uh, and, and, and the investors and the pedigree are all important. So to come back to the question of, is the cash there or it's not the cash? Yeah, I guess it all depends. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when people invest in a, in a SPAC, they actually have the opportunity to vote on the merger. Mm-hmm. So if they don't like the merger, they can vote no. They also can vote yes for the merger, but also no, they want their cash back. So, you know, they can get their cash back as part of the, what they call the de process. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But, and therefore, one way to protect against the uh, oasis turning into a mirage is to have buy-in, you know, that the investors, the people that are supporting the SPAC are also supporting the acquisition target. So that that's one way of, of doing that. And that requires, you know, uh, a choreography, a roadshow. Also, the sponsor of the SPAC is very important in order to attract those people too. So it kind of goes hand in hand. And then what's generally very common is that you need to do a parallel pipe as a critical element to despacking. That's to ensure that any of the money going back out of the system, that you now actually, again, bring in money in. Mm-hmm. So it's it, so so it cer- certainly um, there's certainly risks that you can actually have your SPAC approved, but there'll be no money there at the end of the day. So it would be no fundamentally different than just merging into a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a shell company. OK, um, the, the the company itself. So so the, you talk about the merger, you talk about the, the, the company itself, the, the target, the, the acquisition. Right. You you use the hunting license analogy. Um, is is a SPAC created? This is a very simplistic, you know, very 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 simple simplistic question. Is the SPAC created having acquired the target? You know, pl- plenty of folks go hunting but don't come home with any game. <laughs> so, is, is 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 this a is this a is this a high fence hunt where you pretty much pick your target? You're guaranteed that it's there, uh, and once you have enough money to pay for it, you you, you, uh, you, you, you know, you achieve, uh, success or, um, is there inherent risk in the creation of the SPAC and the potential or the possibility that you may not find a suitable acquisition target? Uh, you know, there's a couple of different ways to answer your question. You know, I would say given the, uh, the explosion of SPACs, the number of people with hunting license, you know, everything in life is a numbers game. So, you know, you know, being able to find quality, I don't think there's any issue in terms of finding uh, targets, mm-hmm. whether or not they're good targets or quality targets, you know, I think is, is um, a dynamic that one needs to consider. But, you know, the, 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 the sponsor of the SPAC is the one who's controlling that, right? They're the one who are interviewing. So there's no so they, they do control that, that general 
uh, process. Mm -hmm. But but there's also risk too, right? Because you're putting up money, you know, there's the printing costs, there's the banker's fees, you know, and then you need you need the working capital to find the target. So, you know, they've got real skin in the game. Yeah. So they're going to really work hard and that's why they're going to get their promote. And that's why they get their 20%. And again, that 20% can be negotiated too. But it's also, I think about, you know, the syndicate that's around the sponsor. You know, if you look at some of the specialist investors and particularly in biotech, you know, um, these are becoming very clubby. And when you got these, and in biotech, these clubs become self-fulfilling at the end of the day. So it's kind of like why the IPOs have been working. You know, uh, you know, they up until recently they've been working really well because there's a lemming mentality that follows the club, mm. and so that that's why all SPACs aren't created equal. You need to look at the pedigree. You know, so if you're looking at going public through a SPAC, you know, if it's not the right pedigree, if it's not the right group, it may not be the right vehicle for you. Or you have to ask yourself this, are you happy with just going, merge, going public through a, into a shell company and, and then building out your capital structure from there? You know, the cash may not be there, but you may, you may want to just start from that perspective. If you're okay with that, then, then, you know, then a SPAC can work. But then I would ask, why are you giving up 20% of, of of your company for that you can do that without without the costs and, and the overhang because it is a process it's probably you know three to six months to be able to despec uh quickly you know there's a proxy process people vote on it um so it all it all very very much depends yeah okay the business of biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at citivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. You, you alluded to the fact that the, the model is, um, you know, it, it's, you see it in several different industries, um, but we've been seeing a particular uh, activity in, in the biotech space. Why is it that SPACs are particularly suited well for life sciences companies? I, in some respects, it comes back to a couple of things that we were touching on earlier. Um, and I, I think it's about the specialist investor, right? You know, you're talking about who, who is the sponsor, who's behind the SPAC, and do they have uh, the ability to, to validate uh, companies? And, you, you know, so a lot of the, a lot of the crossover invest, uh, investors that you've seen, I think almost all of them, I think it's easier to pick pick out the ones who haven't yet, uh, have created their own uh, SPACs. Um, and I think they're on, you know, more than one. You know, there's at least two, maybe they were even on a third at this point uh, or more. And and as a consequence of that, it's really no different than a crossover. It's just a different pocket of money, right? That you're now picking your horse and, you, and you're creating liquidity quicker. Otherwise, a crossover investor had the risk, the market risk of the company uh, not getting out, you know, the, the private holding costs uh, prior to being a public entity. So there's there's advantages to them. And because they're specialists, because of the lemming mentality, when they do a SPAC, they're bringing the investors with them, too. You know, they, they're coming into the SPAC and they're taking the full ride. So I, I, while SPACs may come in and out of fashion, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think as a vehicle for life sciences, given the nature of the specialist investor um, and, and the way the syndicates work, you know, I think it is something that will certainly be a suitable uh, way for a life science company to be go public. And I can turn, continue to see these guys to uh, to uh, use this as at least one of the tools in their toolbox. Yeah. You know, there is there is more regulatory scrutiny and like anything, when the pendulum goes this way, it'll go this way. But I, I do, for all intents and purposes, see it as a viable uh, tool and that they're here to stay, particularly for life sciences. 
Okay. Let's uh, let's let's hang there in the in the regulatory space for a minute. Um, so I was curious, you, you mentioned early on in this conversation that, uh, you know, there, there's generally sort of a two year time frame, some guardrails around uh, the execution. And, and you've mentioned a couple of times that there's some more regulatory scrutiny. So um, one, is that like, is that two year time frame? Is that something that's 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 regulated? Uh, and, and, and what other regulatory considerations are there? You, you know, uh, it's a good question. I, I, I would say that that's generally, you know, there's kind of a SPAC template and that's generally what the rules of engagement are. OK, I don't be, I don't believe that's regulatory driven I be, because, you, for instance, if you don't hit your two year mark, you can negotiate extensions at times with people. So if you're in process, typically that, that it's less costly, you know, everything has a cost associated with that. Um, but it, it, if you have a, something, a target that's already in process, you need more time to close, whatever it is, but you can generally get extensions. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and, and I'd say things are ne- somewhat negotiable, but you know, there's, there's, you know, there's always mutations and a bank may have a different flavor, you know, in terms of the warrants, how those factors work. But I, I would say that from a regulatory process, you're going through the SEC. Mm-hmm. You know, this is just like a reverse merger. You know, you have to get the um, the proxy in place and the shareholder approval. And, and, and you know, you're running a pipe in process and that pipe is usually going to have registration rights associated with that as well. So those those are the uh, the, the, the primary considerations. I, I think given the fact that when any, when, when you have the prevalence of these many SPACs and, and, and the risks of self-dealings and, and all sorts of other factors that go so, that are associated with it, I think the, the, you know, the SEC and others are starting to just take a closer look to make sure that investors aren't taken advantage of. Sure. Um, so, you know, like anything, it's, it, 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 it lends itself to those, those situations as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, we, we, as we've mentioned, SPAC activity is hot right now, but you've told me that this isn't, uh, it, it's not new per se. So, uh, g- give us, let, let's <laughs> g- give give us some perspective on the, on the market as it sits today with a little bit of retrospective on, on where it came from. And then maybe we'll talk about where, uh, where, where you see SPAC opportunities moving forward. So kind of, kind of give us the, a little bit of backstory on uh, on how this came to pass and what the market looks like now. You know, I, I, I think it, I think it really, in many respects, speaks to the nature of the amount of money that's in circulation right now. Mm. Uh, and the fact that, you know, given given the amount of money in circulation, uh, it, 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 it's a, it's a product vehicle that you get basically giving people jockeys uh, a hunting license to go after targets. So uh, it, it's a factor of liquidity. And I think you can uh, attribute it to many different considerations. And they, they've they worked really well and they've worked really well. So when things work well, they, that has a tendency for a lot of copycats and a lot of followers. And at least from what I've always seen, um, usually things are continually done until the point that they break. And 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 that's I think we're, we're certainly it's an, we're getting to an interesting time in terms of that, and I'm, I, we can talk about that uh, yeah. a- afterwards. But I, I think for why they're working, particularly in life science, it, it, it caters to the ingredients that seem to work. Like if you're going to go public, you know, and I think the success factors associated with SPACs are associated with. Um, which what leads to a, a successful IPO, you know, they're, they're one in the same. So it's just an, a, another vehicle that leverages the power of the jockeys because in biotech, it's all about your validation and your cap table, you know, uh, and with that, yeah, obviously you need data, you need to execute, but that, you know, that certainly gives you the, the wherewithal that if you got the right management team and you got the right science and you're allocating your resources appropriately with the right cap structure, you know, it, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in order to be successful, 
whether it's an IPO or a SPAC, it's the same ingredients and it's the same interview. It's the same filters. You're talking to the same people. Uh, so, you know, if you think you're going to do a SPAC instead of an IPO, you know, because you may not attract the investors that you thought you could do on a crossover, you thought that this would be a clever way. There's no, there's no getting around those folks. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you, you're, you're raising your money from a different group of people. And if you want the fast money hedge funds and be in retail hell forever, that's a, that's a way of doing it. You know, you can get your data, you know, as long as you got your data, uh, that, that trumps all, all, all cap structures at the end of the day. Right. But I think you, you need, you need to start early. You need to lay the groundwork, you know, you need to allow at least six months, if not more, mm -hmm. you know, you must be audited. You need to have internal control readiness. You need to have, and you need to have a crisp message and story, a message that resonates and, and, and I think those are really critical. You know, if you don't have those considerations, if you're not ready to move, you know, folks are going to move, move on from you. Uh, okay. In terms of those investors, um, the, the, the specific investors, you, you've alluded to this a little bit, but I want to drill down just a little bit more if we can. If I am a, a, an innovator, if I'm the, the innovator, the sponsor, the founder, uh, and, I'm, and I'm looking for an investor uh, community, to, to back this play, what should I be looking for? Is it the traditional, you know, look for a cultural fit, look for a good match, look for, or is it, a, is it a sort of a different set of rules as it relates to putting us back together? Are you looking at it from the eyes of the, of the sponsor or are you looking at it through the eyes of the target? I'm looking at it through the eyes of the sponsor. What's, what's my thought process there? The, the role. You know, I think you want to, uh, you want to be able to identify something that that that's attractive to investors, right? You want the money to stay in the SPAC and you want the SPAC to work after you've de -spac -ed. And I, I can give you an example of, of I, I was actually on, in respect to one of the companies I'm involved with. We were we, we were approached by one of the SPACs uh, that I would say that had a pedigree. Um, cap structure and, you know, and, and they're, they're onto, I think they're, they think they just despack their second one or they announced their acquisition and they're on their way to the third. Mm -hmm. um, but suffice to say they, they passed on the company that, that I was involved with because we didn't have necessarily the, the pedigree of investors that they were looking for. They had their pedigree, but basically what they were saying was that because we didn't have necessarily the pedigree, that was going to require more work. Going back to my earlier comment about speed. And yeah. it was kind of like, you know, we're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to visit the proctologist's office. You know, this is going to be a little bit more invasive. It's going to take more time to get people comfortable. You know, if we can get somebody, if we can find a company that has uh, some investors in it that we, we know already, that we're familiar with, we can leverage off of that and save time. And again, it speaks to validation. You know, validation can come in data, validation can come in partnerships, validation can come in, you know, it, mm -hmm. you know, your, your the pedigree of your cap table. You asked me, when I asked that question, you asked me what perspective I was approaching the question from. And I, I said the sponsor, you asked it specifically if I was considering that question from the from the target, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, perspective. What, what, what is their play or role or say even in the equation? You know, it's it's an interesting uh, perspective. You know, I, I, I would say at the end of the day that, you know, the sponsor is totally in the driver's seat, right? They're the ultimate decision maker and they have a pile of choices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that that's that perspective and, and their consideration on terms of how they're filtering through. And, and we've certainly been in a period of incredible company formation. So, you know, I raised the question of how many targets there are. I think that I think the dynamic of time becomes very interesting, too, in terms of that dynamic. You know, I think when you, you embark on these things, you set your bar pretty high. I think with the passage of time, you know, you know, uh, you may lower that bar, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it is a dynamic that I think companies can be mindful of. And I think the targets may potentially be able to leverage depending on who, what and where. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say that a company as a general rule has their own choices. You know, you can stay private. 
You can you can uh, raise a private round. You can look to go public. You can look to merge. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can think about what your strategy is and what you consider success and what your goals are. I, for one, like optionality and preserve choices. And I think it always allows you to engineer a better outcome Mm -hmm. at the end of the day when you're not boxed in. Yeah. So, you know, so from that perspective, I think uh, I'd go back to something I may have said earlier that no SPACs are created equal. And, and, And with that said, you know, if I was a target, I would want the pedigree. I think if you're if you're going to be looking at anybody who who's done it, one of the SPACs going back to what we're saying about that they're all over the place. You know, you can't can't walk around without stepping into one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I, I would say that, you know, you be careful, you know, be careful what you wish for. Be, you know, it's may not be there. Uh, the cash may not be there because really in that situation, you, you don't have what I would call um uh, life science, sophisticated investors. And, and those those are the investor base that's likely going to churn out of your cap structure. And they may very well take the money too. So at that point, you've given up arguably 20% of your company on the promote. There's arguably no money in in the till. And now you got all the costs of being a public company. Uh, you have someone else in your knickers uh, uh, in terms of the sponsor, and you still now have to go raise money. And now you're doing it disadvantaged. And right. you're probably going to be very costly. It's going to be all sorts of warrants, other things. And, you know, it's not what you hope for. Sure. Okay. We've, uh, we, we've talked, um, as a matter of fact, you just alluded to it uh, a few minutes ago about, you know, things working until they don't anymore, things working until they're, until they're broken. Um, and, and we've, we've discussed the notion, uh, recently, uh, that this boom in the life sciences markets, uh, surely won't last forever. Um, so, so let's kind of transition that and talk, talk specifically about the SPAC market. What's the, what's the forecast look like there? You know, they, 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 they go hand in hand. Uh, I mean, the SPAC market is a broader market. It's not just about biotech, but, you know, I think mm-hmm. the market, the market is, um, is it's certainly frothy, but we, uh, and, uh, you know, I think like everything, when the pendulum goes one way, it's going to go the other way, you know, in terms of data points, the last time we saw, uh, SPACs being prolific and nowhere near, near this level was, you know, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, you know, right, right. Going in 2009, I was actually involved with a, a de spacking that went South mm. because the markets went South. And that was the end of that. Um, So, you know, is the the proliferation of SPACs a new market metric in terms of market heights? You know, I only have a data point of one, right? An N of one. So I can't say that that, that's, that's statistically relevant, but, you know, given the fact that history has a way of repeating itself, uh, it's certainly something that I would not be dismissive of uh, and certainly pay attention to um, for sure. Yeah. Okay. What what haven't we talked about here? What haven't I asked you, Alan, about uh, about SPACs that you think would be valuable fodder for our audience? You know, I, I would certainly say that, as we've said, that I think they are particularly well suited for biotech. Uh, they definitely represent a surrogate IPO pathway. Mm-hmm. They provide meaningful access for specialist investors and a good management team. It is a particularly efficient capital formation vehicle if you're looking to go public with the right ingredients. Uh, as I said, all SPACs are not created equal. Yeah. Uh, you need to really work with high quality biopharma investors. I mean, that's, I think, an essential ingredient. And then I think there's also, you got to think about just like an IPO. An IPO isn't the finish line. The SPACing isn't the finish line. You know, you have to worry about aftermarket performance. You know, you want to, as I said, you want to avoid the need to turn over the investor base. Um, and then, you know, by doing so, that will facilitate prospective reduction in your cost of capital. You know, if you, otherwise it can go quite the other way. The idea of accessing the public markets is to reduce your cost of capital. And if you don't think you can do that, what's right. the benefit of going public? I mean, there are other attributes and considerations, but you do want to reduce your cost of capital over time and be able to pivot and raise money on uh, when, when things are relevant. And, and, you know, be careful what you wish for, you know, uh, <laughs> can't say that enough. Right. 
Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up, Alan. I appreciate the the time and insight. Man, we we start talking uh, deep in the weeds on on this uh, market stuff. I I'm glad I can lean into you uh, into your knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> now, always great, always fun, and uh, to be continued. Yeah, sounds good. So that's Alan Shaw. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the business of biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva, a life sciences company that, like Life Science Connect and Bioprocess Online, remains dedicated to the support of new and emerging biotechs. You can learn more about Cytiva by visiting cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. I'd also like to encourage you to visit bioprocessonline.com to subscribe to my newsletter. If you like what you heard here, subscribe to the pod. Give us five stars and tune in next week. Until then, thanks for listening.